Welcome to the ABA and PT podcast, where I interview scientists and practitioners from the world of precision teaching and behavior analysis and share their journeys of how they found their way to the science of behavior, as well as their discoveries through the use of the standard acceleration chart. I'm Mandy Mason, a scientist practitioner in Perth, Australia, impacted by my daughter with autism, who caused me to knock on enough doors to find my way to this extraordinary field. And I'm on a journey to share how precision teaching and the use of the standard acceleration chart can change the world and make it a better place to live. So I've set myself a lofty goal, to seek out the giants in the field of precision teaching and ABA, share their journeys and discoveries, and influence the work of practitioners who want to be profoundly impactful with their clients and to have the heart to chart. Welcome to part two of the ABA MPT podcast with Patrick McGreevy, where he covers a lot of topics from the problems with using percent correct to measure behaviour, fluency, standard measurement, why the majority of the ABA community do not use standard measurement, how to chart certain types of skills that don't make sense to train in repeated timings, the essential for living curriculum, and lots, lots more. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome back Patrick McGreevy. Let's go all in with Brother Pat. And so I decided that when I wrote this little piece that that Abigail asked me to write for the book on Remembering Og, I would just make my short little piece about just personal interactions and remembrances of Og rather than some of the more technical aspect. And so that's what I did. I have written a couple of papers in the last year or so, uh, one with a colleague of mine, Stelios Homonides, who has been a long-time user of the standard acceleration chart and advocate for standard measurement. And both articles were rejected, one by the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis, not so much because of the content, I mean, the quality. They never mentioned anything about the quality. They just, they objected to the content. And what it really was, was, was just a description to some extent of the history of standard measurement beginning with AUG and how it got started, why it was there, why it's important, and to some extent why behavior analysis has basically ignored it and uh, and just chosen to not even want people to hear about it because they've essentially kept it out of Java for all practical purposes. But anyway, I've been... Uh, I've been thinking the last few days about uh, what I will do as I get older and write a little bit more. I think I'm just going to put together a series of papers, short maybe papers about it, and hope that that carries on in some form or somebody at some point picks up and uh, maybe publishes it or gets more people to pay attention to it. And I'm going to start with the article that Java rejected and can continue with several others. So, yeah. but anyway, um, Ogden was when I met him and, and interacted with him, I don't think I ever even really understood fully what he was in the process of doing and what he had done. And then gradually I became, I came to know about that and came to appreciate it. But essentially, what most people in the behavior analytic world don't understand is that Og was trying to carry on Skinner's legacy of measurement. And basically other behavioral people were not doing that. Yeah. They were carrying on his legacy of, of understanding behavior, managing behavior, that sort of thing. But with regard to the measurement part, they simply ignored that or they simply turned away from Skinner's measurement, history of measurement. And, and then Og wrote an article about that later, and it was rejected by Java, you know, and it became the book Skinner on measurement yeah. that several people put together after he passed and completed his work in that area. But that became the book Skinner on measurement. But what Ogden did is uh, Ogden pushed that issue of measurement beyond where most people had. And, and most people don't understand that the standard acceleration chart is the next derivative of the cumulative record. Yeah. 
because the slope of the cumulative record was rate or frequency. And now frequency are the dots and the slope is the change in frequency. See? And that's the next mathematical derivative of the measurement that Skinner started with us. But people, people in behavior analysis largely quit. They quit on rate. They went to percent and they quit on rate or frequency and you hardly ever see it. You see a few articles here and there, but not much. And they just quit on that. And some of the, well, the major names in behavior analysis. I was part of a symposium in 1984, uh, Og and myself and a couple of his other students and Don Baer and a couple of his students. And I can still almost remember word for word the title of, of Don Baer's paper in that symposium. And it was on the less frequent, uh, frequent use of frequency as a response measure. He was saying, don't count the number in the period of time. Don't do that. That's not where we're headed. And of course, he was part of the founding group for Java. And that's exactly where they did head. And they have to continue to do so. And um, what the, the people who essentially followed in Og's path have tried to maintain at least some degree of presence of standard measurement. Many of us have even suggested that when you let go of standard measurement, you're let, letting go of the science part of what we do. Because science doesn't progress without standard measurement. You, you can't decide to measure things however you want to in whatever units you want to. That has to be accepted by the scientific community. <clears throat> and when it is, you can proceed. I mean, when you have certain units, like, like when the measurement of earthquakes, when that started and then developed and changed several places. But um, there were units for that. And the scientific community accepted those units. And that's what didn't happen in behavior analysis. Yeah. How do you think, I know you can't sum up the whole behavior analytic non-precision teaching world in one group, but in your experience, when you ask them about the standard acceleration chart, how, how do they see it or how do they view the chart and, and why are they reluctant to use it? Well, the, the the reason, I mean, I've had articles that I sent to Java years ago and they wouldn't even review them. They yeah. wouldn't even send them out for review. So that's just a blatant uh, bias against the content. They yeah. don't even want people to look at it. Nowadays, what people say is there's no, the, the evidence for standard measurement is not convincing. They will say things like that. The, the, there doesn't have to be any evidence. It's the wrong. It's the wrong way of looking at it. Do you accept that standard measurement is a part of science? If you accept it, if the, and that's a fundamental. I mean, any scientist would reasonable scientist would would accept that. But if you don't accept that, okay, then what you are saying in the same breath is that what you're doing is not part of science. Yeah. And of course they're not willing to go there. And they don't want to they don't they don't want to touch that topic frankly because what it would say to them is the last 50 to 60 years of behavior analysis hasn't been science. Yeah. And, and, Has it really been properly could not properly be it could be called a precursor of science but not science. Mm -hmm. So when you reverse the question and, and ask, you know, where's the science in percent correct? Where do you draw your evidence for that measure of mastery or however you want to call it? Mm -hmm. How can they respond to that? They don't. They, they don't. don't. They, just, they just don't want to respond at all, so they choose not to. In most cases that I've interacted with them, both vocally and written form, we decided in our new teaching manual, we have a, there's a page and there's a box that has a red border around it. Yeah. And it doesn't, it doesn't have a title. The box does, has no title. And when you get to it, 
uh, all it says is what is in this box is understood by very few people who are behavior analysts. And then it starts in on percent. And it's about two paragraphs on percent and why percent is not a viable measure of anything, but certainly not human behavior yeah. or animal behavior, either one, or 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 infrahuman behavior, either one. It's 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 a frustration that people like uh Kent Johnson and Carl Binder and yeah. we're the long timers, Clay Starlin, Abigail Calkin. Yeah. We're 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 the group of people who who are still alive, who have been doing this for the longest amount of time. And yeah. then there's more than that. There's a few more than that. But there aren't all, you know, that that group of long timers isn't a large group. John Eshelman is in that group and Bob Worsham and a few others. Uh, uh, but um, but it isn't a large group. Yeah. So what would you say to the young BCBAs that um, that I know some of whom follow this podcast? What would you say to them in terms of what they should do to sort of satisfy themselves that they have looked into standard measurement and explored that part of our underpinning? What, what, what's your advice to them when you speak to young people that have sort of not even considered this issue? Well, if you do not, if you do not take into account occurrence, the occurrence of behavior, and you record occurrence, and you do not include time, time is either latency or duration. You see, if you don't include those elements, then anything that you purport to be measurement is less sensitive yeah. to changes than it would be if you had included those elements. And that's that's undeniable. I yeah. mean, even people who don't use frequency couldn't possibly deny that. I mean, that's undeniable. If you tell me, it, it, and, and then you can carry the conversation even further. If I tell you that something is 80% correct, have I recorded the occurrence of that thing? The answer is no. Yeah. Or if I did record it, I've set the record aside. And what I have said is that the relationship between something that's appropriate or correct and something that's inappropriate or incorrect is more important than the extent to which either the correct response or the incorrect was given. So what, what percent says is this, one out of two is the same as five out of 10, and you should consider it the same. Yeah. Or 50 out of 100, right? Or 50 out of 100. That's right. When it's not. But percent lets you think or encourages you to think that those things are in some ways equivalent and they're not. Well, I, I hope, Patrick, that you have influenced enough of us and all the old timers, as you call it, that we have some momentum. Well, I, I, have, I have recently, excuse me for interrupting you, <laughs> I, I, I have changed that. I used to call it the old timers. <laughs> But I think it was Ken Johnson who pointed out to me that it would be a little gentler and easier if we call ourselves the long timers. Yeah. Yeah. Not the old timers. Oh. <laughs> the amazing thing about that is all of you look so young and you're still working most of you time. and actively participate in the field. And so, yeah, that says to me, it's it's not proof, but that it, there's something about precision teaching that keeps people young and vibrant. And, and you know what it is? It puts you in contact with your learner as close as you can get to their behavior. And it changes the way that you can to make changes in the moment, to be sensitive to their learning, to make the programming about the student. And it makes you extremely accountable to what you're doing. And as soon as you change that data to percent correct and everybody goes, wow, this kid's getting 80%. That sounds great. You lose touch with your learner. And so I would just advocate because I was a long time <laughs> discrete trial instructor that used percent correct to make decisions, how different 
your teaching is when you put your student's performance on a standard acceleration chart, how different it looks and how it changes you as a teacher and as a behavior analyst. And it makes you much more accountable and in contact with your learner. And um, it, I just would urge everybody to, you know, people can learn to chart in a matter of minutes. <laughs> so it's, I never understood that, you know, it seems like a, a major response effort to learn to chart, but I literally have taught parents to chart in five minutes and they get it. Mm -hmm. So I, there is no reason why someone that holds themselves out as a scientist can't learn to use the chart, right? Absolutely. I like now, I'd like to point out to the, the listeners mm. the beautiful way in which you just said that. And I think it's very important is that when you stay with frequency, latency, or duration, when you then you're closer to your learner, you, you are really close and you can make changes almost instantly when you're doing that. When, when you go to percent, you have to take that data, that nice sensitive data, that represents what the learner actually did, which is important. Yeah. And then you go to a calculator and put that into a number. Now you're removed from your learner. You've lost what your learner actually did. And, and that distance between your data, you and your learner is now greater. You know, the, the incredible thing is that someone that is a precision teacher, so a little bit of training and how to read a standard acceleration chart who has never even met your learner can pick up a chart and within minutes know that student. Like just recently I had a whole lot of charts for my own daughter reviewed by an independent precision teacher who has never met her uh, and had to write a report for the court and she and I was not allowed to talk to her because she's a an independent witness. It was as if she had known my daughter for 18 years. Like that is how a chart shows mm -hmm. up, that you can immediately come in contact with the learning of that student because of how much information that a chart conveys. It's phenomenal. And it's it's devastating to me that there are kids around the world that need this uh, technology so badly and people are not turning their mind to the underpinnings of our science. But anyway, that's my quest for the rest of my life is to advocate for parents to get in contact with a chart because, you know, the best thing about that, if there's any parents listening to this, and I know there are, is that it makes whoever is working with your child highly accountable for what they're doing when you as a parent can chart the data and measure performance of your own student. And you're going to know a lot more about your own child than the person that is working with your child if you can take data and put it on a standard acceleration chart. You will become an expert in how your child learns and you'll make that person accountable. Um, because the number of parents that persist with interventions that are completely ineffective over long periods of time and then learn to chart and go, if I'd known this tool was in existence, I would have worked it out a long time ago that my child was not learning and mastering things and applying them and generalizing things because there was not enough performance of that skill. You know, I saw that with my own daughter before I came to precision teaching, that she would do, you know, years of work on a skill like for instance, greetings or something like that, and never use them functionally. But then when you worked out how many opportunities a day that she had to practice those things and the amount of time between opportunities to respond, she was never going to master that skill. There was never enough practice. And as soon as you put that on a chart <laughs> and you see no learning on the chart, you know, this is, you know, stop teaching, change something. Like let's change something anyway. Let's try something different. So I just want to advocate for parents to, I've just recently taught a number of parents to chat, and I am really committed to that. So anyway. Along that line of what you were just saying, it's important to remember that when you do, to, when you go to percent, you lose fluency. Yeah. So you, you, you've acknowledged in some ways that fluent responding doesn't matter. Yeah. Now, recently I've been doing some writing on that topic and, you know, I, I began to understand something, I think, and I say, I think but I never quite really thought about before. And that is this, generalization is an issue for many individuals with more, especially for individuals with more limited skill repertoires, probably because they can't mediate their own listener responses. In other words, they can't, they can't walk around thinking about what they're going to say next 
not easily and do it. And so they don't mediate a lot of their own listener and speaker behavior. I mean, that's a pretty good guess. We don't know that for sure, but that's a pretty good guess. But so the generalization with many of these learners doesn't occur. Now, if you think about something that you learn to fluency, does the context, in other words, is the generalization issue even important? Or does generalization sort of fade into the background? In other words, if I say to you, like in, in, in the U.S., we would use an expression, I before E, except after C. And many kids learned that in school as a rule of how to spell. Yeah. Now, once you've learned that, I before E, except after C, is there a context in which you couldn't do that? Even if you were, if somebody had just, you know, said something very offensive to you and you were momentarily and emotionally distraught about that and somebody said to you, I before E, would you not be able to say except after C? No, it would come right off the tip of your tongue. Yeah. It would be right there. Yeah. And, and when you needed it. And so I think that when you work with people and you don't, and you stay with percent, you you pretty much ignore the possibility of that happening. And I think we could make a serious case that fluency, teaching to fluency, is even more important for many skills than teaching across contexts for generalization. Because if it's fluent, the context probably won't matter. Yeah, but I agree. But the really important thing about the chart is you can test for it. <laughs> yes, so, you absolutely. Know, it was so much easier than like the old rule that so many programs apply as oh, 80% correct across two sessions and then, you know, a novel person in a different context. And, you know, it might drop to 70% or something and you say, oh, we, well, great. We've mastered that program or passed that program. We can move on. But guess what? On a chart, when you know a kid is hitting, say, 70 or 80 per minute in your teaching context, and then you probe, you go, okay, let's ask parents to do this at home. What can they get? I mean, I'm doing this with a parent at the moment. So my kid has hit like 50 one-step instructions in a minute for a whole minute and no errors. And so I taught my parent to do it at home. And guess what? He's getting 46, 47 with an untrained precision teacher on one-step instructions at home in the presence of distractions, free of reinforcement, you know. Um, That's right. So And so on my chart, my generalization probe or however you want to call it, sure. says, guess what? My teaching was effective. This is showing up with people that, in a home context and without error and without just dis with distractions, full of distractions, but you can't see that with percent correct. You can't see that this kid can do this at this extraordinary fluent rate in one context. And as soon as I change the context, he can still do it or he can't do it anymore. So my teaching hasn't been effective. So th the chart tells you that it makes you highly and, and what you do. And it shows up when it isn't working. And then it tells you a lot about the learner. Like, you know, some kids will have different difficulty with generalizing to new materials. A lot of kids will have difficulty generalizing into novel environments. And you learn a lot about your student. Okay, that means I have to train a lot in environments with distractions in them. But the chart will tell you. You don't have to guess. Well, and and if you, uh, I'll give you another, another example that not a lot of precision teachers realize or know yet is that Let's say that you're, you see, a, 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 a large portion of people who would call themselves precision teachers live above the one per minute line. Yeah. That's where they stay. Yeah. But you see, we don't. I don't. I'm, I'm below the one per minute line all the time. That's yeah. where my learners live. Yeah. So if you're going to test for fluency or teach to fluency, you can't repeat the task over and over again in yeah, a short period sense. of time. It isn't even, it isn't feasible. If I'm teaching you to respond to your name from a distance away from me, I can't say, Mandy, come here. And then you come, okay, let's do that again. Go over there. Do Okay, Mandy. Okay, let's do it again. Let's do it again for one minute. It isn't feasible. Yeah. So how do you measure, how do you measure fluency? How do you do it? First opportunity probes. We came up with this years ago. That's how you do it. And when a person can do it on the first opportunity of the day with no practice, and they can do that for a bunch of days in a row. That's probably equivalent to 15, 20, 30, 40 a minute. See what I mean? 
And yeah. that's the way you can teach to fluency when you can't repeat the task over and over again. It just isn't feasible. Yeah. To repeat it. And and so that's more and more what I want to get more and more people into and start thinking about it because I mean you uh, there are certain things that you can practice over and over again for a minute or 30 seconds or 20 seconds or whatever but certain things just aren't feasible true and but isn't it true too and I'm going to put the link to your book Patrick because I'm I'm still in content from you now but what's important there is the number of opportunities that the kid had to respond versus the number of opportunities that he got correct right across a day that that's meaningful data on a chart like the the difference between the number of opportunities to respond and the correct responses because if you have three opportunities a day and you got three correct on a chart you know those two things are going to match but if you had one opportunity and one correct that looks different on the chart as well so as a fair pair, that's an important thing to capture on a chart, isn't it? To- the total number of opportunities that you said come here and number of opportunities that the kid actually came. Yeah, now that's fair pair is to... fair pair was originated by Owen White. Uh, right. that was that, that was Owen's expre- expression. I think originally where fair pair came from, you can't just count less incorrect. You have to have corrects too. And I think that's true. Now, however, there are examples of when a child is has such a history of making errors that for short periods of time until you teach them to tolerate the errors, I remember years and years ago, we called them learning opportunities. We even abbreviated it LO. You yeah. may find a few of the long timers who remember that expression. Yes. LOs, we used to call them. Yeah. And so in the beginning, one of the things you would do is the children weren't willing to make errors. They'd had so much failure. They don't want to make errors. They don't even want to count them. Yeah. So you might count the corrects for a while. But then in order to get the kid to respond in, in a more free operant sort of way, you could reinforce them for just saying something else Yeah. and tolerating an error. Yeah. So sometimes you start with the correct only just because of the child's history, yeah. but then you can teach them to tolerate errors, their own errors, and to not be, and to not find them. When I, I took one year off in special education and I was a sixth grade teacher for a year, and I had a boy in my class who was quite bright. And so I exempted him from spelling for the whole year because I gave him a couple of spelling tests and and he was like, my God, he was he he was a blur. He could he, he could spell faster than I could. Yeah. And 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 so what I would do is then I would send him off to the library and I'd say, bring back 10 things you don't know that you've never heard of, you have no idea what they mean. You bring those back and teach those to the class. And he taught social studies to the class. One of the sixth graders taught social studies to the rest of the class because <laughs> he was that bright. Wow. You know. And and but the beginning to be to get him to do that, he was a little reluctant because you know he would say, "Well, what if I'm not sure about something?" Well, that's good. That's it's okay not to be sure. You see, but I had to teach him that I was okay. That was fun. Go find stuff you don't know. And so some of our learners will be a little reluctant to make errors in the beginning or to have anybody count their errors. But we'll teach them it's okay. We'll yeah. teach them it's okay. Yeah. And that'll be a good lesson for them to learn. Yeah. Yeah, we still call them LOs. Right. So I wanted to um, just maybe finish up. There's so many things I could talk to you about. Just to finish with your thoughts, your last sort of experiences with Og before he passed away and what contact you had with him in the last period of his life. And anything that you remember that you wanted to share about that time? Gosh, there was there are so many. I I know that he knew that in those days that I was struggling because very few people were using the chart below the one per minute line. Yeah, and I was struggling with doing that, and uh, and he knew that because the struggle with the the chart has always been the lower half in terms of the decimals. 
Yeah. And if you have to report something, and Og and I had talked about this several times because he said, well, you stop and think about it. You should not report something in a unit in which it can't occur in nature. And and then he gave several examples of that. He said, well, like, for instance, basketball. Basketball will give a trophy to the person who has the best um, a number of points per game for the whole season. But what will happen is somebody will be 28.6 and somebody will be 28.3, and the person with 28.6 will get the trophy when there's no such thing as 0.6 <laughs> of, a, of, a, of a basket, of, of, of a point. There's no such thing. So we're recording it in a unit at which it can't occur. We do the same thing. The average American family has 2.4 children. Well, then you can't have a 0.4 kid. So we as scientists should always try to report things in units in which they would actually occur in nature. And that, with the way the chart was configured, didn't permit that. You yeah. had to, it isn't that it didn't permit it, but you had to change the way you read the left-hand scale. Yeah. See? And so... And I developed a little adaptation, which a lot of people, uh, most people don't use, but which we use, which maintains the integrity of the chart. In other words, the dots are every, they're, they're the same place they would always be. There's no change in slope, anything. Everything's the same. But what it allows you to do is to say one per 10 minutes instead of 0.1 per minute. Yeah. And 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 when you live in the lower half of the chart, that's a big deal. Yeah, because when you talk to people, well, that's how often that well, point one per minute. Well, let me see. Point one is actually one every ten minutes, but now you recorded it for twenty minutes, and it it gets kind of that gets tricky. It gets it, it gets ask. tricky and dicey. It does. Uh, so we've used this adaptation, and it, it it retains all the integrity of the chart. The, the the dots appear exactly as they would always appear. You can even read duration off the right hand side because. If you go, you know, one per 10 minutes and then one per 20, and then the next line down is not one per 30. That's I right. mean, it's not 30 minutes. Yeah. On the standard chart, it's not. But with the adaptation, it is. And so you can read duration directly off the chart without using a finder or anything. You can And you can use, you know, and you can record units in which they would, in which it would actually occur in nature and you don't have to and that's always been a bit of a struggle uh with for people now for people who are mostly using it in an academic or pre-academic context it's not a concern because most of that can be done in in small samples yeah and you can just say everything below the one line is less than one per minute and they can wrap their head around that but as soon as they get to the <laughs> uh, these are the parents that I work with they have real difficulty wrapping their head around you know point or 0.01 or that's really hard for them. I always just talk in terms of examples like if I drank three cups of coffee, where is that going to appear on the chart? You know, below the one line or above the one line and they can wrap their head around that. But the actual math is a little trickier below there. Um, but the kids I work with too spend a lot of time below <laughs> their, their behavior is down below that chart, very the one line very frequently. So on that note, Patrick, is that chart that you are adapting the y-axis on not adapting, but renaming the labels on the Y axis. That's that the <laughs> that's that's the proper way to say it. It's it's just a renaming. It's just that's a right. renaming. And are are you going to make that available? That chart. Well, I have given it to several people who have used it in several places, and uh, I'm going to. Uh, I'm in the process right now of putting together a uh, a little a cleaner and nicer, little better formatting, and making sure that it has exactly the same dimensions because yeah, I want to make sure that the dim dimensions were just I mean a fraction of a centimeter off but I want it to get the perfect status right. so I'm I have to have it's in the illustrator it's in the program called illustrator yeah and so I'm I'm trying to find right now somebody who's really good with illustrator can help me do that and when we make that just little tiny slight adjustment then I'll put it on the website and people can print it if they like and use it if they like yeah, and to a specified size. There's a number of people, and I understand why they are, 
is that they're reluctant to have any change in the chart. And I understand that. Yeah. I absolutely understand that. But the long timers know that I would never do anything. Yes. To compromise the integrity of the chart under any circumstance. And if this couldn't be accomplished with even the slightest bit of integrity, I would never, I would never have it out there. Never. And I wouldn't use it myself either. Because that wouldn't be worth it. If the times two or or the or the the log progression was in was changed at all in any way, uh uh-uh, uh, nope, I'm out. Yeah. I'm out because there's no way that I would because then we're just because see several people over the years have adapted the chart. They've blown it up, they've changed all kinds of there's about six or eight different versions floating around out there. No, no, no. Those people who do it had good intention, but they don't understand standard measurement. That that can't be messed with. That can't be messed with. Even what what is difficult is because the standard chart requires an eight and a half by eleven or an A4 piece of paper to in order to print the whole thing. So, by the way, in your part of the world, do they call it A4? Yeah, we have A4, like they do in the UK. Yeah, like like they do in England. They call it A4. Well, it's different to your, we call the size of the chart is letter size. Letter size, yes. Yeah, so (laughs) when when I first started bringing out standard acceleration charts to Australia, we had to buy all of our binders from America and all of our paper so we could print on. And bless Scott Bourne, he eventually helped us start printing charts in Australia as well because it's very expensive to get them out here. But we had to modify so we could go down to your size, everything. Now we have all of our charts in an iPad. So PDFs of the charts in an iPad. So that it's all standard. It doesn't matter. But we used to have to get special paper from America so that we our charts would match our programs in the binder. Otherwise, there were these bits sticking out the end, which was a nightmare. So, yes, we call it letter size here, what, what the chart well, is. Well, if you don't have access to at least a letter size piece of paper, yeah. Okay. If you don't have access to that and you need to print it out, okay. It and 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 you'll see this in some forms. It then, and if you if you just or a slight photocopy, which will change the dimensions of the chart slightly, you you won't lose the acceleration. In other words, yeah. the acceleration will be at the same angle, so you don't lose the slope. But what you lose is you lose a sense of the of the what's the best way to say it of the increase from day to day so if you're familiar with the term frequency multiplier yeah that gets distorted yeah and see to 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 retain the full value of the chart the full value of it the times two vertical distance needs to stay the same yeah now, when you have to shrink it to print it in another format, the times two is gone. Yeah. Because now the times two won't be the same distance, even yeah. though the slope, the acceleration, will be the same. So if you're looking at, at short-term differences, they'll be distorted. Yeah. So I'm going, I'm in the process of writing an article about that. And that's what a lot of people don't stop to think about. So what what I suggest people do. And there may be a, a, a better or different way to do it. I don't know. Is that you take that small piece of the chart, you photocopy it, and and then you lay that over the top of the other piece of chart, so you can see a little tiny bit of the chart. And people know it's not the whole chart; it's only a little bit of it. Yeah. But it retains that times two. Yes. So that this is the actual distance of the growth. And and in order to maintain all aspects of the chart, the standardization of every part of it, that seems to be necessary. But it's as long as the slope is good, most people consider that enough. No, not for me, it's not. I'm a purist about it. I want it to be the, every piece of it. So if you have to shrink it because you can't get it in. I have an article I, we published years ago that Java wouldn't even look at. And it's published in a medical journal in 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 the UK, and it's it's in a smaller version. See, so the chart is shrunk. Yeah. But did the accelerations come out right? Yes, because the shrinking didn't change the slope. Yeah. 
the angle. Yes. But the but the shrinking changed the frequency multiplier. Yeah. Yeah. As soon as you start to play around with that, all of a sudden, all of the charts that you have on a learner, they're not standard between the learner. Yeah. So anybody looking at the chart is is not looking at the same type of chart. So well, as long as you're focused almost solely on acceleration, it doesn't matter. Okay. Because acceleration, but if you were interested, let's say you had some data and then you made a change on something and you wanted to see the immediate effect of the change. Yeah. Like in the first couple of days before you could calculate acceleration. If your chart was shrunk, there would be a bit of a bit of a distortion. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll stay tuned for that chart and um, I'll stay in contact with you and let the listeners know if that becomes available. And then I got off topic then a little bit because you have so much, so much wisdom to offer. Um, but you were talking about OG in the, and this issue of below the one line. And did you want to say anything about your sort of the latter part of OG's life and, and uh, any time that you spent with him before he passed away? What is your final well, sort of? Well, I, I didn't okay. spend an awful lot of time with him in the last year or two. Yeah, uh, he and he and Nancy were doing lots of traveling, uh, and yeah. he was he spent a lot of time in Hawaii and in, in the western part of the United States, and uh, we would correspond even briefly uh, on any number of different issues. When all of a sudden he deteriorated pretty rapidly, and I contacted Nancy, and I remember that I was in Denver, and he was in the hospital in Kansas City. I said, you know, I, it's a one hour flight. I could be there. And she said, I, I don't think he'll be here when you get here. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. And I said, well, then you make sure that he hears my name and that I was thinking of. Yeah. And then six months or so after that, I was in Kansas City working with Nancy and John Eshelman and a few others, and we were archiving Og's material. And we went to the KU Medical Center, and uh, we stood in the parking lot, and Nancy pointed to the window of the room that Og was in. And I thought that was pretty incredible. Yeah. And she pointed, she said, see, Patrick, that window up there, that's where he was. Because... Nancy understood how, you know, that would be very meaningful to us. Yeah. And uh, and then John Eshelman and I spent a couple of days archiving his material. And it was a very emotional time, incredibly enlightening, because we got to we got to look at stuff that he wrote back and forth to colleagues. Right. And he would send something to Skinner and he would say, Fred, look at this. Or something. It was interesting because after he was his student, he called him Fred. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, he would he would send notes back and forth to other colleagues. Uh, Israel Gold Diamond was his very very close friend. Sometimes he would call him Iz. It would just be I Z, and there'd be a note and it'd be a paper he had sent to Iz. See, sometimes he would call him Izzy, but he never called him anything but Iz or Izzy. And of course, you knew who that had to be. It had to be Israel Goldheim, but it couldn't have been anybody else. And then there were other people that he would send notes back and forth to. And you got a flavor for some of his earlier life that was before you were part of his life. Because it was way back in the early days. Maybe I could wrap this kind of thing up with a story from not the last time, but in the early time that Og told me happened. And recently, with the advent of the uh, of Greg Hanley's work with, um, what's the word I'm looking for now? Um, synthesized. Oh, yeah. Synthesized assessments. Sure. That's the word I'm looking for. Anyway. And I, I told Greg Hanley the story because I said, I'll bet you that you don't know this story. Mm-hmm. And so I sat down, we had a beer together, and I told him the story. And I said that when the group to, that got together to form the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis, 
and there was the final vote for what the journal was to be called. There were essentially six people in the room. One of them was Skinner. One of them was Og. I knew a couple of the other names and a couple others. Og wouldn't tell me who the names were, who the people were. I, I think if I had pressed him, he probably would have, but I, he, he just didn't mention that. Sure. And he said that when the final vote came as to what the journal was to be called, it was between Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis and Journal of Applied Behavior Synthesis. And that's why I thought Hanley would appreciate the story. Yeah. And he had never heard the story. And the vote was four to two. The two were Og and Skinner. Yeah. Wow. And the four were the other people. And the two that voted for synthesis were Og and Skinner. And the other four voted for analysis. And that's how it became the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis. Mm -hmm. And the notion was that, that, remember, these were two people who were lab people. Og and Skinner were both lab laboratory people in the early, well, Skinner his whole life and Og a good portion of his life. And in of his early life. And for them, Og used to say, it, the applied world is different than the lab world. Because in the lab world, I can toss a, a cigarette can come out. It used to come out in his labs in those days when they used it as a reinforcer. It would come out of a chute in the wall. And there would be no human contact at all. But when you're in the, the applied world, you can never separate the reinforcer from the person who delivers it. You can't separate the two. And so therefore, to some extent, all applied work is synthesis. Right. It's not analysis. And and so uh, I think many of those who listen to your podcast might enjoy hearing that story. Yeah. Uh, Greg Hanley certainly enjoyed it. I said, look at this. In the early, early days, the two people who would have called Java synthesis were the two measurement people see and here you are how many years later suggesting that functional assessment ought to be more synthesis than analysis yeah full circle <laughs> bob described bob washam describes it to me as the paralysis of analysis <laughs> oh that that's a good expression bob does it oh that's beautiful <laughs> He has some analysis of analysis. I like yeah, that. yeah. <laughs> you can get into something in, in a way that actually doesn't actually occur. Yeah. Doesn't yeah. actually occur. Sure. You know? Yeah. That's right. Well, that's doesn't a wonderful actually... story to finish on. This has been just fantastic, Patrick. I've enjoyed it so much. Every time um, I speak to you, I, I learn more about Og. I fall in love with his passion and his commitment and his dedication, his sense of humor and and everything he bought. And you know, people that talk about him are very emotional about him, and um, and for good reason because he really made a difference on this planet, and he continues to do so through these awesome teachers that he left behind. And um, you're right up there, and I just feel so honored to have spoken to you. I look forward to seeing you in person next. The last thing I just wanted to talk about is. Your uh, essential for living. Um, I will put a link in there. Um, we've already talked about it earlier in the podcast, but can you just talk about the new version that's out and how that's different to the to the version that I would have on my desk somewhere? Well, the the new piece that's out is a teaching manual. It's teaching it's manual. not it's not an adaptation of the first manual. Yeah, the, the right. main handbook. It's just about teaching. Okay. It has that it has that section on uh, percent that I talked about. It has a whole section on teaching procedures that uh, tend to get overlooked in the modern era, especially with learners with more significant disabilities, more severe involvements. An example of that would be movement cycle. Yeah, a lot of young behavior analysts don't even know that term. Yeah, because it not taught in lots of classes these days. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you that if Kent Johnson or or Bob Worsham or Pat McGreevy or John Eshelman taught that class, we would use the term movement cycle, but not yeah. a lot of younger people use it or are even been exposed to it. 
But movement cycle is a big deal when it comes time to teaching a skill in, in several different ways. If you start out to perform the skill and then you start into problem behavior or you act like you're going to go into problem behavior, meaning you make a, a little bit of the movement cycle of the problem behavior, and then you go back to the skill, you're in a dilemma of what do you reinforce? How do you consequate that behavior? Another, another issue has to do with prompting. Let's say that you're prompting a person to make a sign to, to man for something. And the person makes part of the movement cycle, but not the rest of it. So they take their hand and they bring it toward their palm to maybe ask for a biscuit or something, you see? Yeah. And they stop midway and they look around at you. Do you prompt them with the remainder of it or do you start them from the beginning? See, that's a movement cycle issue. Yeah. And in the modern world, most people wouldn't even look at that as an issue. They would simply prompt it from the middle. Yes. But is it possible that prompting it from the middle of the movement cycle could actually reinforce the behavior of stopping in the middle? Yeah. Because somebody helps you and you still get what you're asking for. See? So it it though it goes through some teaching procedures like that that would have been more accentuated 30 some years ago, but are not so much emphasized today, especially when they apply to learners with very limited repertoires. Yeah. And it like, like movement cycle. I, we had a couple of people who first got the book a few weeks ago when it first came out and sent me a note back up. I've never heard of movement cycle. Well, I, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised that you could be in the field of behavior analysis for 12, 14 years and never heard that term. Yeah. Never heard it. And so we tried to revive some of those things that were part of the early history. And then we talk about the use of the of the first opportunity probe, too, which not a lot of people have had exposure to. You know, you still have lots of practice trials during the day and you can still collect data on and off throughout the day on whatever you're teaching, of course. But the first opportunity of the day um, is the data point that's like a test data point. It's not a teaching data point. And no teaching has gone on that day. This is the test. Like, where are you at the moment? Yeah. In, re in reference to the repertoire you're trying to, to teach. And do you chart those first probes as a different symbol or identify them differently on the chart? To nope. okay. no. the first, first data point. Okay, just you just put the first data point. Now, you could if you wanted to make yeah. them different. Oh, sure, you could. If yeah. you wanted to distinguish them, yeah. sure, you could. Absolutely, you could. Yeah. yeah. Oh, without doubt. Um, we, we would commonly keep them on a separate chart. Yeah, right. The first opportunity probes would be on a separate chart. And so they wouldn't have a designation. But if they were on the same one, you would probably have to be using a sessions type, those, those charts that Kent and the gang at Morningside use, those ones where you, where you, every vertical line is, yeah, is, a, is an op a timings chart. Thank you. Timing chart. And let me just ask you, if you've taken one cold probe or however you want to call it on the day, what, what's your timing floor? Where do you it's where do just, you start that on the chart? Is it one per day? Oh 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 yeah. Well, it depends <clears throat> on um on the skill. If if what you're doing is part of something that would be, <clears throat> let's see, the best way to to describe this. What about the example you gave before, responding to name or coming from a distance? If you did a cold probe of that at the beginning of the day, how would you chart that one? Measure that's latency. Yes. Well, okay. here's what it is, and I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with how to make this clear to people without that's having true. to that's do true. this yeah. four or five times. What the first opportunity probe is? This it is a combination of it, it's it's a measure of time because it's only one occurrence. Yeah, it's a measure of time. The time is the latency plus the duration. So if I say come here, from the end of my saying come here until you're standing next to me, that's the measure of time, and that's what goes on the chart. Okay. And that's what you're it's looking for. It's a measure of time 
not a measure of occurrence. Yeah. Because there's only one occurrence. Yes. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. So it'll but, be. But it's but really what it is is it's a measure of latency and duration added together. Yeah. And now we call that in plain language responding as you would want a person to without hesitation. And the without hesitation is minimal latency and minimal duration. And obviously, you'd adjust those if a learner had a physical and orthopedic impairment and they couldn't move quicker. And so you would, your free, your your fluency aim would be relative to the person's physical ability. Yeah. Because some some people, if they had spastic flexion or something like that, they wouldn't be able to start their arm movement fast as fast as many other people would be able to. And if you had an orthopedic impairment, you you couldn't get to the other person if it's come here as quick as somebody else could. And well, I have a lot of questions just about this one goal. <laughs> but I just ask you a few more. So let's just say, you know, you would have an aim, I guess, by student approximately of how long you would expect a person to be able to respond to their name at a given distance. Yes. And then presumably by because this is how precision teachers work, individualize the student, et cetera, and, and the context of teaching, et cetera. But then let's just say this was a very important goal for that learner because it, there may be kids that elope or run away or, or, or don't have safety awareness. Would you then program for a number of opportunities a day to teach that skill, to prompt and shape and reinforce yes. those skills? Yes, absolutely. And would you try and afford a certain number of opportunities a day by learner for that to occur? Like, how do you program? Yes. Okay, good. That makes a lot of sense. And then if you wanted to put it on a standard light chart, you'd, you'd have to use a timeless chart. Yeah, okay. So let's just say you had... Um, but but what, what, what we would do yeah. most of the time, we would just put that on a data sheet. Okay. We would, and you're we, just going to measure the cold probe. I mean, but but you certainly probe. could use a timeless chart. You yeah, certainly okay. could use yeah. Oh yeah. Well, Would no. you ever choose like the best performance of the day and and chart yes. that? You could do you could do that. Yes. What would you, you could do? The best or the worst or the worst or the middle or the middle or the first, which is what effectively what you do, right? Well, yes, you could do the first. The reason that we like the first, yeah. It, years ago, Vince Carbone and I used to call it cold probes. Yeah, that was our name for it because it was. Cold meaning the opposite of warm up. Yeah. And so. Not any press. And we. Things. Yeah. It, it's like, you know, people in in various like even people, like I say, actors tend to use that term. If you're practicing for a play and you have never practiced it before, and somebody just comes up with the line, they'll say that was cold, meaning the person never practiced it. Yeah. And it, it, it suggests to other people that this person might be very good with, with this play because they can do something cold with no practice. No practice, yeah. And and it and it comes out pretty damn good. Yeah. But 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 they do it cold. That's yeah. what that's what people call it. They do it cold. And yeah. so we use that metaphor to be that. And it was, and then the the plainer English for it is without hesitation. Yeah. And the without hesitation is both latency. And duration, yes. meaning you don't hesitate to get started, and you don't hesitate on the way to being to, to, to completing it. Yeah, and in essential for living, you know, how many of the skills in there are latency and duration measures? <laughs> Is that that's a hard question? Well, depending depending uh -huh. on how you depending on how you teach it, they could they, that 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 could occur often. Yeah. Yeah. What are some other but examples? With, with a lot of the skills, you could you could teach them with a cold probe. Yeah. And then and then come back. Now, we what we didn't we we decided not to show in Essential for Living how to chart a cold probe on the standard chart. Yeah. It was enough to get a few frequencies below the one per minute line, and I thought, boy, we take that on, and I just think we've we're really going to send simple. people out the door if we do yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. But but I think that. Uh, that could be a little paper that I write and put on the website that that it wouldn't take very long, but um, where you would show you how to do the cold probe on the chart. 
Uh, it, 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 let's say that if you can imagine it, the right hand side of the chart and what what your first measure, let's say that it's it's a person coming when their name is called in a public setting yeah. because they tend to wander away from a group. All right. Yeah. yeah. And so you say, Mandy, come here. All right. And the first day you do it and it, it she Mandy doesn't come here. You have to go get her. And the whole process of that takes two minutes. So two minutes becomes your first data point on the chart, two minutes. And then as it gets down to five seconds, you'll see improvement on the chart, see? And how do you just then when you get to the point of where your aim is, yeah, there you are. How do you discriminate in those cold probes, whether there was any assistance needed versus like independent response? Do you ever do that? You don't? Okay, cool. You just care about how how long it takes. Well, you could, you could, a way that I've seen some people do it, um, is that it would be an X yeah. until the person was prompt or, or there was almost no prompt left and then it would become a dot. Yeah. That makes sense. Something like that. I've seen people do that. Yeah. And I've, I've done that on occasion. That's just an arbitrary thing. How do you chart duration in the chart? Is it a backslash? I've always charted it just as a horizontal line, like it's a like it's a record floor. Oh, okay. That's the way I've done it. And I know I know other people do it do it differently. <clears throat> but I've always just done it as a years ago in the early days. Yeah. Everybody did it with just a horizontal line like it was a record floor. Yeah, okay. And so if it was a But the difference is a record floor was always Tuesday to Thursday. Yeah. So it was always between two days and a week. But a duration line was was a horizontal line, but it was it was not quite the distance of a Tuesday to Thursday. It was it was a it was it wasn't as long a line, but it was always a flat line. And then later, those tilted lines yeah became more common. Did Og ever use this duration like that? Og didn't use duration very much at all. So Patrick is the in fact in fact there's a. Uh, one of the things that I regret that I I looked back later and I found some references that Og talked about and Skinner both talked about is that the how much more how much more important frequency as a response measure was than latency or duration, either one. And advised people to always use frequency and try not to use latency and duration. And and I I don't remember Og saying that or distinctly, and I found it in Skinner's verbal behavior, and I thought, holy God, I wish to heck those two guys were here, and I could ask them. Uh, I'll bet you that Carl Binder would ha- might have some insight into that, and maybe Clay Starlin might have some insight into that, but I think. I mean, I only went to the latency and duration measure when the frequency measure just wasn't feasible yeah, and, I mean. and couldn't easily be captured. Yeah. But both of them warned against doing that. But when you can't, within reason, collect a frequency measure, I'll give you an example. Uh, this. Oh, maybe four or five years ago, I was at a place and a a facility and they were teaching this young man to open up a cupboard door. So imagine a kitchen and there's a counter and then there are cupboards that are up. So you have to reach up to get into the cupboard, which is a little bit above the counter level. And so what they did is there were four cupboards that were in a row. And so what they would teach the young man to do is they wanted to get frequency. So they were using a 20 second timing. So what they would do is they would have him open the first closet, the first door, the second door, the third door, the fourth door. Then somebody would come by and close them and he'd go back and start again. Yeah. Okay. And they did that for 20 seconds. So how many doors could he open in 20 seconds? And that was the measure of fluency. Well, later on, when we were over there sitting, talking, sitting at a table, having coffee, turn around. Here's the guy over there. He's over by the cupboards. 
And he went and he, instead of opening one cupboard, yeah, he's opening all that's something. He opened them all, went back and closed them, went back and opened them and yeah. looked around to see if we approved of it. And then you think, well, wait a minute, we're talking told? the wrong thing. I know. Yeah. We were, we were so interested in capturing the frequency <laughs> that the skill we taught him was the wrong skill. I, well, I had exactly this happen yesterday because I'm teaching a kid <laughs> to make coffee, you know, with those pots. Yeah. And we don't want to waste a lot of pods. So we have him put the pod in and then we reach in and take it out and put the pod back in and have him push the pod through. And guess what? The first time, you know, I did a cold probe, if you like, he's like putting the pod in and then reaching in and getting the pod out, yeah. putting it back in again. <laughs> so it's exactly the same thing. The stimulus control is all wrong. If you do a repeated practice of something that's only going to occur once in that trained skill. So sometimes component skills make sense, but that depends on which type of learner you're working with. I would like to have had Skinner, <laughs> Jack Michael, Oglinsley, yeah, all in the room because Jack wasn't here either. And when I when I came upon that, finding that, and and just and just said to them, "Okay, guys, if you couldn't do frequency, what would you do?" And I think. It's just about your only option for a sensitive measure of behavior. I don't see another option. Now, I'm not the wisest guy in the world. There's lots of people brainier than me. And maybe they could come up with something. I know the first person I would go to in a conversation like that would be Abigail, Clay, or Carl Binder, or John Eshelman. Or Bob Worsham, those are the people I would go to and say, okay, if you're in that dilemma, what do you what would you do? Okay. I don't think you have another option, but maybe it's there's an option out there I don't see. Okay, well, um, there's a question for those people. Hopefully they will listen to this podcast and we can get some responses from them. But we wanted to make sure that fluency remained at the top yeah. because that that's that's the heritage. That's Eric Cotton. Yeah. Eric Cotton is the one who got us into fluency because Og wasn't even into that. Eric was responsible for getting Og into fluency. Yeah. And and then Joe Lang and a few other people over the over the years contributed to that too. But um and Kent Kent, of course, because Kent was essentially a student of Eric's. Yeah. Was essentially a student of Eric. I mean, I think Kent would say that. You know, not just Og, but Eric was major in his life. Eric had enormous influence on me and uh, and a lot of us who were present in those days, who were there in those days. Eric was a fluency nut. Everything was fluency. Yeah. Every single thing was fluency. He was he was over the edge on that and wouldn't give up on that for anything. Well, what a joy. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and specifically, wow. you know, you've worked with learners that not many people, you know, have the opportunity to work with. So you have a really unique insight into these high need kids, right? And how, how do you describe those learners that you love so much? Just learners, I guess. And and I enjoy it. So thanks for the opportunity because one of the things that I feel like us long timers can do is that we can help younger people have some touch with the people who were around at the beginning of all of this, because we were there near the beginning, yeah. not at the beginning, but near, we can uh, help the younger people have a sense of connection, whatever that means to uh, those people. Um, yeah, I and think- I enjoy and I enjoy doing it because uh you know, it it isn't it isn't like it happened so long ago that I don't remember or don't still have a feeling of what an impact it had on me. Yeah. It was it did. And uh it was it was. And and you know, I wasn't interested in somebody who thought it was a cute idea. Yeah. He wasn't interested. He was <laughs> You were all in, boy. <laughs> yeah, you we just all in. podcast all in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like it. Either you're all in, or, or you're all you know, out, or or go, or go find another professor. <laughs> <laughs> did you ever well, hear? It's him, all right. Did you ever hear him say, 
those specific words to any of the students? All in? No. <laughs> no. I don't think I did. No. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't I don't I don't I don't I don't recall it, but but I think I said to you before, his way of saying it to me was can you resist the pressure of the mainstream your whole life? Yeah. Can you resist wow. that? Can you are you ready to to stand up for something that's probably not going to be popular in your lifetime? Super. So he, he are, saw that. Are you there for him? Hmm? He saw that. I mean, obviously he lived that oh, yeah, he very oh, closely he his whole life, living in the minority in the field, but he didn't see that that was going to change. Well, see, when he interviewed me, it would have been the early part of 1972. Wow. And you see, that's four years after Java started. So yeah. see, he that was four years ago for him. Yeah. He had been through that. He he already knew the resistance to the standard acceleration chart and standard measurement. He already knew what was coming. And he saw the intensity of the reaction. Yeah. You know. Uh, and then when I got to Kansas University in the summer of 1972. And I registered, and another student up there at the same time, Linda Glenn, we both registered for, I won't say who, because I don't want it to sound derogatory, but but one of those people that were uh, major influences in behavior analysis, especially with Java, we both registered for his class. And we were both invited not to attend his class. We were invited to find another class to be in. Wow. And boy, on the day one, we got an idea of, whew, You're dealing with boy, it. oh boy, wow. yeah, yeah, you're one of Og students, uh-uh. Wow. Yep. Ooh, yeah, we got a sense of it. Look from, at the resilience of you all. <laughs> from the resi- yeah, we got, we got a sense of it right away. We yeah. did. But then, but then you had all the people like Eric and all those people around you and, uh, and, and some people who aren't with us anymore. Like some people who were major contributors was Steve Graff was an amazing and Eric, of course, but, but Steve Graff was just utterly amazing individual. Maria Ruiz was another example of, uh, she was a student of Hank Pennypackers. Yeah. And she was an amazing individual. And, 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 and I'm, I'm forgetting several others as well. It, well, on that note, that's an awesome note to end on. You have a chapter coming out in Abigail's book. Well, when I say Abigail's book, the book that she is editing that is going to launch at IPTC, I understand. That's exciting. So, uh, Yes, it is. Are you going to Very be there? Very exciting. I, I, the, the current plan is for me to be there. There are several conflicts. I'm going to try to move those conflicts out and be there, yes. Oh, that would be so good for that book to launch and uh, they'll – I will be there and I really look forward to thanking you in person for this, for giving up so much of your time and, and sharing ah, them. And yeah, I really loved it. <laughs> I love this time. It would be very precious to me for the rest of my time. Thank you so much, Patrick McGrady. Oh, you're, you're quite welcome, Andy. Thanks for doing all of this. And sadly, that's where I left Brother Pat. I'm so grateful to have had Patrick McGrady on the podcast. Surely you can't have listened to that podcast and not be questioning your use of percent correct if that's what you're doing. Stay tuned for episode 13 of the ABA and PT podcast. I have a number of guests in the planning and recording phase right now, and I can promise you more legends of the precision teaching world will be launching soon. You can find us on Facebook at the ABA and PT podcast, and for resources shared by our guests, join the ABA and PT Facebook group. See you next time.